Hey, this is Brian Yance, and I'm uh, scheduled to be here tonight. And um, mm-hmm. we're, yeah, we're at the door. Okay. All right. I'll be right out. Thanks. Bye. before I talk about the, the stir stuff that happens here. Um, you know, you got to know a little bit about the history before you investigate what happened after that history, you know what I mean? Um, so George here, George and his brother Edward Adams moved into Adams Mills a couple miles north of here. About 1827, where they built the flowering mill and made a lot of their money in the beginning that way, uh, taking flour and grain down the Mississippi River all the way down to New Orleans and it was with that enterprise that started them on the Underground Railroad. Uh, they would actually smuggle slaves underneath the floorboards of these boats, these river boats, bring them back to the mill. Once they made it back, those slaves were given their freedom. Made a lot of money that way. They had, their brothers ended up building two identical homes in that area. Uh, he was married twice in his lifetime. First to a uh, Clarissa Hopkins back in 1845. They would have five children together. She passed away in 53. He remarried in 1855 to a Mary Jane Robinson of Zanesville. Because the house by the old mill had many, uh, too many sad memories of his first wife, he decided to build for his second wife this grand fairy tale castle mansion right here. Uh, started in 1855, c- completed in 1856. Immediately after it was completed, it was destroyed in the fire, started by the chief bricklayer, George Blackburn. His big plan was to break in and uh, start a fire, destroying the place where he would go back to Mr. Adams and ask for more money to rebuild, uh, basically making more work for himself. Um, Night of the fire, the very night before they were moved in here, they stood across the street right out here in front of their temporary house, two-story house they were living in and watched, uh, as you can imagine, with a great deal of sorrow, uh, horror, as their future home went from flames. Uh, George Blackburn later wandered into Dresden, a little town down the road here, and, um, stopped in the tavern, got drunk, and opened his big mouth about what he had done here. So his big plot was discovered. Sent to a penitentiary in Columbus, where he broke out eventually, and wandered back into the area, tried to break into a farmer's house, got caught in the act, and uh, ended up with an axe blade in his head. The ruins of the first mansion were leveled over and a lot of the bricks were salvageable enough to rebuild or build the smokehouse and the barn. Um, today you can still see the evidence of that fire when you, when you take a look out there. Um, let's see. So this place began in 1856 and completed in 1857. Basically identical to the first one except they made the load-bearing walls thicker with more brick and plaster. They even put a layer of plaster in between the first and second floor, just in case the fire would break out. The house, most of it could be saved. It was used as a firewall, and more importantly, the family could be saved. And so right away, it becomes uh, not only a private residence for the Adams family, but it becomes a stopping point along the Underground Railroad for roughly eight years, up until the end of the Civil War. It was used to that capacity. Um, let's see. During that same decade, uh, in the 1850s, Mr. Adams used his own money to build a suspension bridge over the Muskegon River. Unfortunately, that was destroyed in the 1913 flood that came through this area. He also built an Episcopal church in Dresden. Um, let's see, Civil War years, he gave a lot of his financial uh, means to support the Union Army. All the boys that fought in that war from this area were outfitted through his finances. Uh, when that war was over with, he threw a major victory celebration down in Dresden. Uh, paid for roughly ten, about $10,000. Uh, lasted about a week until the time Lincoln was assassinated. It has long been rumored that Lincoln visited Prospect Place. This would have been the stopping point, the midsection between um, Illinois and uh, D.C., Springfield, Illinois. They stopped running the railroads at nighttime. They were fear of the 
Confederate terrorist attack. So this would have been the middle area. Uh, they both would have shared the same political views, uh, family um, values. Uh, it's it's uh, also Mary Todd Lincoln is said to have been a distant cousin of the Adams. So it's probable. Um, Civil War was over with. He became interested in the railroads. Uh, gave a great deal of his land towards the expansion of the Steubenville and Indiana Railroad, where he would serve as director. Also, the Muskegon Valley Cincinnati Railroad, where he would come to own. If you take a look out the window out here later, you'll see a line of trees across the road, across the field. Ran, that's where his railroad ran. As on those rails in 1912, that the train accident happened. Um, the burn victims were brought here to Prospect Place and placed in the basement where they would be transported to a burn hospital in Mount Vernon. Um, let's see, he owned a great deal of land. Yeah. Uh, he owned about 14,000 acres of land when it got here. Big time stock raiser. Thousands of head of cattle on his property. Um, let's see, he died in the house August 31st, 1879, down the hallway in his bedroom of what the doctors called a brain fever. Uh, today's medical terminology would have been uh, meningitis of some kind. He left behind his wife Mary and seven children. Mary took her seven million dollars of inheritance money and back to Zanesville, where she was originally from, to be close with her sister. Each of the seven children received about a million dollars each. The house itself was inherited by his oldest daughter, Anna Adams Cox, and her husband, William Evans Cox Jr. Uh, he came from a successful family in the area. However, this gentleman right here, he was not uh, fond, he was not practical of making money. He seemed to be much more humble to spending of money. Him and Anna lived here uh, for several years, living off that inheritance money. Uh, spending lavishly on parties and uh, renovations to the building. In the 1890s, that, that money began to run out. That's when he decided to get on a train and head west without telling a soul, leaving her behind. It was later discovered that he died in the 1906 earthquake that hit San Francisco. That's what we found out happened to him. Meanwhile, Anna remained here in the mansion, heartbroken, confused over the disappearance of her husband, trying to survive here financially. And at one point, she sold the copper roof to the building to make money, uh, borrowing money from family members that were still in the area. In 1898, she sadly witnessed the death of her adopted daughter, Constance, who died at the age of 21 of consumption in one of the upstairs bedroom. It's thought that Constance is perhaps around. Um, let's see, 1912 happened, and the train accident happened on the rail set her father owned. Those victims were brought here, the burned victims were brought to the basement. It's very cool down there, very damp. Um, would have been somewhat conducive, comforting to those victims until they were transported. In 1924, she tries to walk across some ice. She slips and falls and breaks her hip and she dies of pneumonia in her bedroom upstairs. Um, after that, it remained with the Cox family up until 1969 when the gravel company came, took the property, and they dug for their gravel in the back here. Uh, that's when people started to break in, vandalize things. All of the fireplaces that are in this building were made with the finest marble. Those were all destroyed in those years by vandals that broke in. I know, I, I share that, I share that with you. That's but crazy. It, it's sad to think of what happened in here after that. You know, you can imagine the look of this place. You know, it's just uh, incredibly uh, sad when you think about it. You know. <coughs> um. Anyway, 1988, uh, Dave Longberg from the Basket Company. You know who he is? Uh, he was very fond of historical places, and he he bought this place, managed to put a new roof on. He had some big renovation plans. Unfortunately, he died before any of that could really fully be accomplished. Uh, stayed with the Longenberger family up until 2001 when his great great grandson, George Adams, who we met here today, came in and bought the property with his business partner and turned it into the GW Adams Educational Center. Um, trying to make it a good deal for history tours and history buffs. And, of course, being on the national TV twice in the last five years or so, um, quite popular with the ghost hunting crowd. Now, we're talking about every night people spending the night here. Very quiet during the daytime, at nighttime around 7, 8 o'clock, all kinds of cars out there.
<laughs> and they come in with maybe a handful of digital cameras or they come in with cases of stuff and you know, all kinds of cords and tripods and extension cords and they, they take over the house. So. Um, well, the room we're in now, right now, guys, is the gentleman's parlor. This is where the uh, gentleman of the house, Mr. Adams, would bring his male friend back in here. Being uh, what kind of mind he had with the anti-slavery uh, underground railroad, you can imagine the discussions that were held in this, in this room. When the guys were back here smoking and drinking away, the women and children were not allowed to come back in here. Um, when a boy got to be about the age of 15, he was finally allowed to come in and sit with the older guys. Notice the molding work around the, the ceiling there. Uh, it's quite common for a gentleman's parlor to have that, that decorative quality. The ladies' parlor down the hallway here, um, less, uh, less decorative, uh, but uh, you know, I'm, I'm one of those more or less kind of guys anyway. Um, reports with this room here, there isn't really a whole heck of a lot that I've heard of. Um, I, I know of one little story, a, a group was spending money to spend maybe four days here in a row. They, they had some money to spend. I, I, I was here during one of those days, and I was pulled over by one of the members, and she had a story for me with this room. She, had, she had apparently had her mattress here, and uh, after a night of ghost hunting, she decides to crash on the mattress, and um, she starts hearing, not that, but she starts hearing uh, what sounds like a woman crying from directly below. Uh, the, historically speaking, the room below this one, the room below the one across the hallway, were the ones that were commonly used for the Underground Railroad. They're the ones that had the fireplaces and the, the wooden doors. So what she heard that night, you know, we can all speculate, but that's one little thing that's all I thought I'd share with you. That's cool. Of course, take what you hear tonight with a grain of salt, I, I certainly do. Well, right here is uh, definitely the loudest floor in the house, creaking. Uh, most of the floors in this building are pretty solid. Um, got a fireplace over here once again. This would have been the library. George Adams uh, conducted his business at Parish from home. Telegraph box used to hang in that corner there. Uh, this is also a homeschooling classroom for the youngest of the children. A governess was brought in, hired in from uh, New York to come in, teach the youngest ones. Um, once again, another room where there's not a whole lot of stories that I know. Just because I haven't heard anything doesn't mean it's a rare occasion that I actually get to talk with people that spend the night here. So, <laughs> there's probably a boatload of stuff, I just don't know about it. You know, when I leave, I'm going to shut the gate behind me on the way out so no one trespasses and bugs you. That'd be awesome. Doing your thing. Um, well, this room right here was the ladies' parlor. Uh, this is where the women and children would be found in the early evening hours. Behind the pocket doors over here would have been the Adams' dining room. It's where they had their meals. During special occasions, holidays, they could slide these doors open. One big room. Um, a couple years ago, I was told an interesting story with this room. There used to be a mirror above the mantel there, and a girl was here on a ghost hunt back in 03. And uh, she took a picture of herself in the mirror. And she went home, and she looked through her photographs and discovered that with this photograph here, she not only discovered herself in the mirror, but standing right next to her, a woman in a black Victorian gown with look up like a black veil. And she was so transfixed by this experience that she, she drove back here and she bought that mirror from George. And he bought it from the junk store across the street. Being a haunted item, what do you ask for such a thing? Um, anyway, I thought it was an interesting story, Pat, so I tell it. Just recently I was going through the internet and just going over some of the images of Prospect Place and actually found that image right here. Wow. 2003. So we were talking right here? Yep. It was like a, like a veil, possibly a veil with the back of a dress showing. I can see the hair too. I mean like... Mm -hmm. 